Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for um, making the effort to come down here uh, on the final afternoon of the Congress. Um, today's symposium is uh, uh, presenting some of our uh, work in PRONIA, which is a multi-site uh, EU FP7 funded study uh, looking to uh, use machine learning processes to predict outcome in early psychosis. And um, in a change to your published schedule, um, the first speaker was not going to be um, Professor Roman, but it will actually be uh, Dr. Josef Kambitz from Munich. Uh, Josef will uh, come and talk about brain age in the first. So, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, my name is Joseph Kambetz. Thank you, Stephen, for the nice introduction. I come from Munich. Um, can everybody hear me like that? Is it all right? Yeah, perfect. Um, yeah, uh, we in our lab, we work uh, in machine learning and neuroimaging, and the main purpose of our work is that we are trying to develop tools and techniques to apply machine learning and neuroimaging for the clinic so that we can actually derive something useful for the patient from this. Um, in the talk, I will present first some general results that we have regarding uh, prediction um, and classification in neuroimaging using machine learning. And then more in the second part, I will talk uh, specifically about some preliminary results that we have from the PRONIA study. I will also give some details regarding the uh, study design. Okay, so uh, one big problem that we have in psychiatry in general um, is uh, that the reliability of our diagnosis, which are currently mainly based on clinical evaluation, is very low. So this is results uh, from the DSM-5 field trials, and what you can see is that one of the major diagnoses of, uh, in psychiatry, for instance, major depressive disorder, has a very low um, reliability, and it actually gets worse. Another complicating factor might be that um, in psychiatry you have um, a big overlap between the diagnosis, so uh, comorbidity is rather um, the rule than an exception. And uh, we believe that uh, using neuroimaging, uh, using multivariate statistics, might be one way to overcome some of these difficulties. And I just want to give you a quick example uh, what is the main advantage of those uh, methods. And it is if you think about uh, two groups um, in blue and in orange plotted here, uh, and you measure two variables, x and y, um, then you see clearly a pattern that separates those two groups. Um, if you plot them together, those two variables. But if you just look at one individual variable, for instance, in this case at the x, you see that the distributions completely overlap. If you just look at y, you also see that this distributions um, overlap completely. So if you just look at this data at a univariate perspective, you'd probably throw it away and not use it anymore because you would believe that there is no information contained in the data whatsoever. But um, obviously, um, there is some pattern, and multivariate statistics is one way of detecting those patterns. Mm. This is some examples of uh, what uh, machine learning can be used in the field of psychiatry. Um, there's two big areas. One is the prediction of outcome. Um, this is a, um, a meta-analysis by Paolo Fusapoli, um, who showed that if you look at patients who are at risk for psychosis because they have some clinical symptoms that are not um, in the uh, yet, yet as intense as in, in psychosis, but might point into this direction that those subjects have a, a transition probability of between 20 and 30 percent to transit to psychosis within the next two years. Um, and um, Nikos Kotzoleris, who is the lead of our lab, showed that you can use machine learning and neuroimaging to separate um, subjects that will transit to psychosis from those that will not. So this is a potential application that you could use neuroimaging to predict who will transit to psychosis. Um, and another big area where you can apply machine learning might be the um, prediction of treatment response. So as you all know, um, there is medication that is quite efficient in psychiatry, but the problem is that we never know um, which patient will respond to which medication. So in a clinical practice, we have to try out one drug after the other. Um, and one potential application might be to use machine learning. This is work from Adam Checkroot from Yale, um, who used clinical data to predict who will respond to a specific antidepressant or not. Mm -hmm. 
Um, what is very important is that uh, when you do machine learning, um, is that those models are very flexible, so they can adapt to quite complex pattern in the data, and if you overdo it, then also to noise. And the problem is that this will then generalize poorly to new data, um, and therefore we employ cross-validation. That's a technique to get an estimate of the generalizability of our data. So you would split, for instance, if you have a bunch of brain, brain images, your data into train and test data. You would apply some variable selection procedure, generate the models, and then use the untouched test data to apply to the model compare the predictions with the true labels and get an estimate for the performance of your machine learning model. Okay, the first work that I would like to present to you is a meta-analysis that we conducted to look at uh, studies that use machine learning um, in combination with neuroimaging to differentiate patients with schizophrenia from healthy controls. We did a literature search and could identify 20 structural MRI studies, 11 resting state studies, um, and nine samples that used other imaging modalities, DTI for instance, or molecular imaging. And those are the results. So this is a forest plot for the sensitivity, this is for the specificity, um, and what you can see is that across um, all studies, you will find approximately 80% sensitivity and 80% specificity. So that means by, on average, using neuroimaging in combination with machine learning, you can separate just on the basis of neuroimaging data, and um, you can separate patients with schizophrenia from healthy controls with 80% accuracy. What is interesting and, uh, about this is that we compare different neuroimaging modalities and we found that the um, resting state data um, shows a higher sensitivity compared to the structural data. Um, we did further moderator analysis. Um, what is uh, interesting is that, um, and this is probably a confound to our analysis, that uh, when you look at um, the chlorpromazine equivalent, that the sensitivity, uh, sorry, the specificity is higher for subjects uh, that received more antipsychotic medications, subject that, subjects that had a higher PANS rating, subjects um, that were older, and subjects that were in a more chronic state. And this is to some extent to be expected, right, because subjects that are sick for a longer time, receive more medication and so on, probably have um, more extensive brain alterations and are therefore easier classified by a machine learning classifier. Um, the fact that the rest resting state data outperformed the structural led us to conduct another meta-analysis to look at um, functional connectivity patterns in schizophrenia. And we looked at studies that use graph analysis. So graph analysis is a way to um, describe the architecture of the functional connectivity structure of the human brain. And what we found is that across all studies um, that there was no change in the global short communication path. So this is a measure for the integration of brain networks. But we found a reduced clustering, and we call this in the study local organization, in the brain networks of patients with schizophrenia. Um, when you look at depression, um, we did a similar meta-analysis to see how well does neuroimaging in combination with machine learning perform if you try to separate patients with depression from healthy controls? Um, and the results were compari co comparable to our previous meta-analysis. Um, it's a bit less, it's about 77% uh, sensitivity and 76% specificity. Um, and what is striking is that if you do again compare different modalities, you again find that the resting state outperforms structural data, um, and the DTI does as well. Okay. Um, yeah, I think I can skip this. And the question is, of course, uh, if you have resting state data that outperform structural data, um, whether those two imaging modalities might capture different aspects of the disease, and therefore whether multimodal um, classification might outperform unimodal classification. We tried this out in a, a public available data set um, and 
applied um, uh, standard in, um, machine learning pipeline, including the NeuroMiner software, which is essentially a wrapper that we use in our lab that is mainly um, uh, implementing the uh, support vector machine classification algorithm. And uh, we compared the structural resting state and multimodal classification, and we found that the multimodal classification um, can outperform the unimodal classification. Okay. Um, now to the Pronia data, I will give you maybe some quick overview about the study and the study design. So it's a longitudinal study um, um, in uh, seven centers in the, in the EU. Uh, we are recruiting recent onset psychosis patients, so those are patients that are ill for not longer than two years and did not receive medication for longer than three months. Um, patients with recent onset, onset depression, they're also not longer than two years. Then clinical high-risk subjects that are identified by a clinical screen, screening instrument like the um, SPIA coctus, for instance, and healthy controls. The subjects are recruited at baseline. Um, then there is a follow-up after nine months where we um, uh, repeat all, in the, all um, uh, the whole assessment. And then there is multiple um, iterations where interval test or interval testings where we see the patients again and um, yeah, assess some clinical items. Um, at baseline and at T1 after nine months, uh, we, uh, we um, assess, um, we do a neuroimaging session including DTI resting state, uh, structural MRI and field map, um, there is a neuropsych battery, there is a comprehensive clinical assessment um, and we also take uh, blood measures. So this is a bit outdated but it shows approximately the recruitment so far um, at this point, I think we have around 1,070 subjects uh, recruited across all sites. Um, the first big problem um, that we encountered when we had a first look at our neuroimaging data is the fact um, that the center effect was stronger than we um, expected. Um, to give you an overview, we have um, seven sites in the consortium. Um, and at those sites, we have scanners that come from two different scanner vendors um, and five different scanner models. We also, uh, because of course it was expected that there might be some scanner effects, did a calibration study. So this consisted of six subjects, three male, three female, that traveled to all the sites um, and got scanned with the exactly same sequences. Mm, and at first I would like to give you some impression of the extent of the um, center effect in our data. Um, so this is some preliminary results. Um, it's healthy controlled subjects and recent onset psychosis patients from three centers, so LMU, this is in Munich, UBS is from Basel and UKK is from Cologne. Um, you see that there's some uh, differences in the demographics, for instance the healthy controls are more female, um, the ROBs are more uh, male, but the main um, item I would like uh, to direct your attention to is the different scanners. So at Cologne, it's a Philips scanner. Um, this, is, uh, this is also the case in Munich, but in Basel, it's a Siemens scanner. So what we did is that we analyzed uh, structural MRI data and resting state fMRI data. It's pretty standard pre-processing pipelines for the structural data. It's a VBMA toolbox. We uh, prune um, irre irrelevant uh, features, we scale, we correct for covariates, we do a PCA to reduce the dimensionality in the data, um, and then we do a standard uh, support vector mach machine classification analysis. And uh, it's similar for the resting state, so um, we do first the resting state pipeline, pruning, scaling, correction for covariates, PCA again, and then the support vector machine classification. So what we did in this case is not predict um, a, the diagnose, but we took an individual subjects and we tried to predict from which center does this subject come from. We did this for Munich compared to Basel and from Munich compared to Cologne. This is for the health controls, this is for recent onset psychosis, and this is the classification accuracy. And what you see is that if you try to predict from which scanner a specific subject comes from, you can do this with almost 100% accuracy. Um, in the healthy controls, in the psychotic patients, it's approximately the same. Um, and then for the other comparison, LMU versus, so this is Munich versus Cologne, it's um, a bit worse. 
Um, and we were discussing what might be the reason for this. Um, those are all German-speaking centers. That's why we selected them for this analysis. So we do not think that this is related to, to language or clinical differences between the subjects. Um, but we believe that it's due to the scanner. For instance, LMU and Basel, this is this, uh, it's a different scanner vendor. And for LMU um, versus UKK, it's the same. So probably um, this resulted in the fact that here you cannot as easily classify um, where the subjects came from compared to this comparison. So it seems like there is a strong pattern in the data that is specific to um, the scanner where the images were taken from. Uh, and what you also see is those are the resting state functional connections that drive the classifications. Um, this is mainly long-range connection from parietal to frontal areas. And the problem is that those connections overlap, at least to some extent, with the connections where you would expect um, diagnostic information. So this is a problem for later on potential application, for instance, for diagnostics. And the same is for the structural data. It's a bit small, I'm sorry about that. But you see there are um, areas all over the brain involved, but mainly also um, in the temporal uh, lobe, which again overlaps spatially to some extent with areas where you would affect, um, expect to find disease-related effects. So the question is whether, or we were wondering how can we attenuate this uh, center effect um, by using the data from our, our calibration study, and those are some preliminary results. We took healthy controlled subjects and um, patients with psychosis, and we trained the classifier now to differentiate between those two diagnoses. Um, and we made use of a statistical framework called uh, generalizability theory. And the idea behind this is this is a, that this is a framework that allows you to um, estimate the, the reliability of um, variables in your data. Um, it works um, principally like this. We have the calibration data. Those are connectivity matrices um, as estimated by our resting state pipeline. So this, uh, in this matrix, um, here you have the different regions of the brain and here again. And each uh, little box um, is color coded the intensity of a, um, of a correlation between the, in the resting state signal between two regions. Um, and principally, we have two factors in our experimental design. One is center um, and one is subjects. And um, each um, functional connect, uh, connection in the connectivity matrix gets a G measure. And this is estimated by using the generalizability theory and uh, connections that have high variance related to subjects get a high measure and connections that have a high variance related to center get a low G measure. So this is how we get for every connectivity, for every connection in the data, a measure for the generalizability. And when we put this together, we call this a generalizability map. Um, then we assessed whether we could use this map to improve our um, classification. And um, again, we used a pretty standard support vector machine classifier, it's a linear kernel, L1 regularization, um, and uh, uh, yeah, implemented in a linear toolbox. And um, this is essentially what we did. We took the connectivity matrices from every subject, and then we reduced the, the dimensionality of this um, data in three different ways. The first is a random filter. So this is a procedure just randomly selects a number of connections for the subsequent machine learning analysis. We have a correlation filter. So this is a filter that would reduce the data to only those connections that have a, uh, a correlation of a specific extent with your outcome label. In this case, it's a diagnosis, healthy control or recent onset psychosis. And then we apply the filter um, using our generalizability map. So those are the results. On the y-axis, you have the accuracy. And this is the cutoff. So um, from uh, here is 10%. This is 90% um, uh, percentile cutoff. So this is practically almost no data. And this is almost all the data. And in red, uh, you see the uh, generalizability filter. And in blue and green, the correlation and the random filter. And what you see um, is if you uh, go along and you increase the threshold, that there is um, yeah, the, the correlation and the random filter are pretty stable, and then they're sort of 
getting low in the when you include too much data and too much noise. Um, but in this area, you see that the generalizability um, filter significantly improves the classification performance in this case. Um, so this is just preliminary data, and we're hoping to uh, replicate those results uh, once the data uh, or the recruitment and then the quality assessment of our imaging data has been completed. Okay. Um, then for the last part of my talk, I would like um, to present you some other approach that we're um, investigating in our lab, and it's called Brain H. H stands for um, age gap estimation and the analysis works in the following way. First, uh, you take um, a healthy control data set, for instance, structural MRI data, and you train um, a regression model. In this case, um, it's a support vector regression to predict the age of the individual subjects. That works particularly well, as you might expect, because of course there's strong age effects in the brain, so you can easily train those um, classifiers, those regression models. What you can do then is that you take um, a new data from uh, new data from an individual subject, you give this data to the regression model, and you look at the prediction of the regression model. And then you can compare the prediction of the model, so this is the predicted age, with the real age of this specific subject. And um, in some cases, the model might predict really well, and in some cases, the model might predict an older age than the true age. And um, this uh, could be interpreted um, as, uh, for instance, an indication that in this specific subject, there is patterns in the neuroimaging data that resemble patterns of much older patients. So it's some sort of brain alteration that resembles aging. Um, and uh, so this is a graph from Hugo Schnack from his publication in this year. And um, Nikos Kotsuleras from my lab um, published in 2015 a paper. And those are the regions that drive this age regression model. And as you might expect, um, there are um, regions involved from all over the brain. So there is no clear focus or locus of the, of the brain aging process. And what is interesting now is if you um, compare different psychiatric populations um, with respect to their brain age. Um, so this is the simple um, uh, regression model where you see in, with color code the different lines, the different psychiatric populations. It's a bit hard to say the offset here, um, but when you look at it in detail, so this is major depression, this is bipolar disorder, and you see that there is um, pretty much no offset, but for the um, arms early and arms late, so those are clinical high-risk subjects, as well as first episode in schizophrenia patients, you see that there is a clear offset on one way of interpreting this might be that you could say there is an, an indication of um, a brain process that resembles to some extent accelerated aging. Um, so we investigated this in our um, Pronia data set. Um, the uh, setup is pretty similar, so we used um, the CAT12, which is the newest version of the, or the newest version of uh, voxel-based morphometry as it's implemented in SPM. Uh, reduced to 3 by 3 by 3 millimeter resolution, pruning, scaling. In this case, it's not a, a support vector regression, but an elastic net regression. And then we have 137 healthy controls, 53 clinical high-risk subjects, 50 psychotic patients, and 47 rot patients. And uh, we didn't use actually the Pronia data set to train the age regression model, but we used external um, data. So this is the ICSI data set, publicly available data of I think it's around seven, six or 700 uh, subjects. We trained the regression model and then applied it to the Pronia data. Um, and this is the result. So you see the clinical high-risk subjects, the healthy controls, the ROTs. So this is recent onset depression, recent onset psychosis. And this is the brain um, age score, so the offset between predicted and true age. And what, you've, what we find is that even though this is completely different data from different subjects and different scanners, it predicts quite well for the healthy, but you see that for the CHR especially and for the ROPs, you find um, a clear um, offset in a sense of that their predicted age is much higher than their real age. 
Um, for the depression patients, it's a bit similar, but not to that extent. Yeah, so I have a couple of more slides regarding um, the clustering of patients, um, but I think that Henry is going to talk about that uh, in greater detail, so I will just uh, skip, skip this part. Yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, that's it. Uh, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks very much. Uh, are there questions for Josef? No? No? Oh. Yep. Thank you for the talk. Um, could you comment on the differences in the actual um, parameters used in different vendors? Are they, uh, were they similar, like TRs and TEs? Because um, we had experiences um, matching the protocols of different machines, say Philips and Siemens. It was quite difficult to match the TRs and TE. So if the vendors had greater impact, and if the impact is coming from the differences in the limitations in matching the protocols, then it was, I, I was actually confused, and yeah. I want to hear your comments. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah I, I think we just don't know. And probably we also will not find out because, um, uh, yeah, as you said, we also tried to um, make the sequences as similar as possible across all the sites. There is like a minimum, minimal uh, harmonization protocol, so like this is what the sequences need to comply to, but it's not identical. So we have small differences between scanning parameters across the sites. Um, there are different head coils, different scanner vendors. Um, and yeah, we, we cannot really say whether it's now Philips or Siemens or it's the head coil or it's the specific sequences. Um, one way of looking at it is, I'm not sure, we were discussing to look at uh, time effects of this uh, uh, scanner, of those scanner effects um, with respect to the calibration data because um, the scanner vendor obviously doesn't change. Um, and the head call also not in many cases, but in some cases people adjust the parameters a little bit and there might be some sort of drift going on. But this is just one way we were discussing to, to look at or to disentangle a little bit those different factors. One more question or? Okay, uh, so I'll just hand over to my co-chair to introduce the next speaker. Thank you, Steven. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the uh, talk of uh, Henry Pezonen from the University of Turku, from uh, the group led by Raimo Sailokangas. He's going to talk about the possibility to use uh, machine learning uh, to stratify uh, heterogeneous uh, presentation of our patients uh, for this uh, project. So please, Henry. <coughs> Thank you very much, Paolo. So this is a sort of a continuation of, of Joseph's presentation. I'm continuing with the machine learning part of his presentation. So basically what, what we're trying to do is that we're trying to build classifiers that take in data modalities, e either one or several, and some other data and do something within a black box and give predictions of, of outcomes, clinical outcomes, or divide uh, subjects into clinical groups. And um, the, the basic classif classification building method that we use is semi-supervised learning, is that we have data sets with several data modalities. We choose a training set. Uh, f randomly from the from the data points from the job section, uh, we build a some sort of classifier, and then we um, the complementary set of the training set. We have the testing set. We test the classifying performance um, on the testing set, and of course this gives us the accuracy. 
and that how many times we predict that the clinical group, for example, correctly. And as far as the machine learning algorithms go, we pretty much all of the time we use support vector machines just because they are quite flexible uh, framework for doing the machine learning. We can use different kinds of kernels, <coughs> linear kernels that Joseph was using in, in some of the stuff. And I'm, I'm using Gaussian kernels here, or radial basis functions kernels. So it basically enables us to classify these kinds of groups where we don't have a separating plane in the data modalities. We don't have a linear classifier that gives us the best performance. We Basically, we may have a, a cluster of points in the data modalities and which belong to some uh, clinical group or other. So, in, for example, in this kind of situation, um, yeah, we can build a, a this kind of is there a pointer here? Yeah, this kind of uh, decision surface there that chooses uh, red points into one group and blue points into another group. And all the results are uh, cross-validated so that we randomly choose training sets and testing sets and that gives us the sort of a overall performance of, of uh, depending on uh, different kinds of data sets. And the performance measures that I'm using here, uh, Joseph, Joseph was using a, um, a sensitivity and specificity. Um, but I'm, I'm using accuracy, which is basically mean of the sensitivity and specificity. And then I'm using Cohen's kappa that basically tells us whether or not our um, decision is, is randomly guessed or not. So there are multiple ways of, of classifying the performance. So um, all of the results that I'm presenting here, these are quite preliminary. So I'm working with a quite limited data set. I'm uh, having a, a 84 subjects from Munich and 88 subjects from Cologne University data sets. And here's the statistics of, uh, some statistics of the, um, groups. So we have a, by far the largest group is, is healthy controls and females are quite overly represented there. Then we have a um, risk patients and then we have uh, depression cases and psychosis cases. And then we have the age division between the groups here on the box plots. And we, not, not only here in these results, we use the brain imaging data to classify um, into different diagnosis groups, but we use pre-morbid adjustment scale as well. So we try to combine different kinds of data modalities. So the PAS, um, um, it, it's a, A questionnaire based scale, so we have different um, childhood uh, periods. So we have uh, childhood up to age 11, early adolescence from ages 12 to 15, and late adolescence from 17 to 18. And within these groups, we have five different scales, uh, five different measures that we scale rates from, from zero to six. So we have sociability and withdrawal, peer relationships, scholastic performance, adaptations to school, and social sexual aspects of life, which is excluded from the, from the A part of the PAS questionnaire. And the other data set that we're working with is the resting state data. So these are uh, seed-based correlation maps. So we have nine different regions of interest in brain and we build a um, correlation map by correlating the signals from each of the regions to all the other regions and we end up uh, with a quite high dimensional you know, data set. 
So we have 4,005 unique connections from um, one uh, from one unique regions to other regions. And here I'm working with data from two different centers and Joseph just showed that the center effect is um, quite problematic. Um, here luckily I chose well Munich and Cologne where the differences between the psychosis patients is not that clear as I remember from the Joseph slides. The, the difference between uh, Cologne and Munich subjects was quite much higher in the healthy controls. So just to um, give illustration of the data sets, um, uh, we um, reduced the dimensionality of the PAS uh, data modality. So we take a three different, uh, three um, most important principal components, and I've drawn them here, and uh, I've divided the data set to healthy controls and psychosis patients. So here is the, well, this is a redundant uh, lower triangle here, but you should just look at the upper triangle here. So you have the red healthy controls and blue um, psychosis patients. And these three components alone, they explain two-thirds of the, all the variability in the data set. And we can see here that um, the ROPs have quite much more variability in the principal component dimensions. And this basically enables us to get quite good um, classification performance uh, using the support vector machine learning. So we get accuracy of, of 79% and Cohen's kappa of about 48%. So quite good performance. Uh, then the resting state fMRI data. So here are again three components out of the 4,005 components that we have in the data. And these uh, explain only about 19% of the, of the data. And this is just the three components here I'm, I'm using in the actual classification, I'm using more than three components. I'm using uh, um, up to from 20 to 50 components depending on, on how large is the, uh, the data set that I'm working on and I choose the number of components based on the best classification performance. So here we get about 67% of, of classification accuracy and Cohen's kappa about 29% um, when classifying healthy controls and psychosis patients based on resting state fMRI. And here I'm, I have all the, all the data sets, uh, I have the Munich and Cologne data sets together here, so the center effect is, is involved here. Then what we try is that we can always, of course, you know, uh, combine data sets, data modalities. So I took the PAS scores and I took the certain amount of, of principal components from the resting state connections. Here's just the illustration of, of what, what's happening there um, when I combine them. So doing some dimension reduction. and. The classification accuracy, when we combine these data sets, uh, it improves on the PAS um, alone classification and it proves on resting state fMRI classification alone. So we get quite good accuracy of 85% of, of separating healthy controls from psychosis patients. And the Cohen's cap is, is also pretty good, uh, 59%. Okay, 
So now we're done with the, we're only playing with, with PAS and resting state fMRI. So we're looking into, can we improve the performance by um, finding different sort of subtypes in the brain? So then if you're working with the resting state fMRI, can we find a certain like patterns in the brain that we can, you know, based on these patterns, we can cluster the subjects into certain amount of, of groups. And here um, I've clustered our um, subjects into three groups. So you can see the three most important dimensions again in the resting state, resting state fMRI uh, data modality where I plotted three different groups with different colors here. So um, we have one group here, uh, one group here, one group here. And what actually happens here is that the clustering, it sort of grasps the center effect. So when I do the clustering here, uh, a lot of uh, the healthy controls from the University of Cologne actually go into the third group. So it's sort of automatic, uh, automatic sort of taking into account the center effects and other sort of similar patterns found in the brain. And then what we do after we find these three different types of connection patterns in the brain, we do uh, classification in each of these clusters separately into healthy controls and uh, psychosis patients. Um, just to give you an idea what happens there, we, we did the clustering but just based on resting state fMRI, but here um, you can see what's happening in the PAS data modality in those clusters. So we don't really see clear patterns, at least in the first three dimensions there. So it looks pretty random. And again, if you take the PAS modality and resting state fMRI modality, uh, take the three most important dimensions from there and illustrate the three different clusters there. Again, we don't really see their clear patterns. But these are just the three dimensions where we see the most variation. These are not necessarily actually the most important um, in classification performance-wise. So the cluster statistics are three different clusters. We have a largest cluster, cluster one. Uh, we have same amount of, of healthy controls. We have 16 uh, males and 16 female healthy controls in the first cluster. We have about 11 um, psychosis patients and four psychosis females in the cl first cluster. And there's the age division of the, of the subjects in these groups, in this cluster. Then we have the cluster number two, which overwhelmingly consists of, of female healthy controls. And again, the third cluster is again a big cluster. So cluster one and cluster three, they are about the same size. And the cluster two, it sort of, it took the clone subjects that had like deviating brain pattern and it put them in the cluster two. And now we do the classification in each of these clusters. So prediction or classification uh, using the pre-mortem adjustment scale, healthy controls versus psychosis patients. Um, classification performance is about 77% of accuracy and cap, um, Cohen's kappa is about 47%. And compared to the performance without clustering, uh, we had a slightly better 
performance. We had accuracy of 79% and Kappa was 48%. In the cluster two, in the, the, the cluster that consisted of, of a lot of, of the clone subjects, healthy controls, when we do clustering in this uh, classification in this cluster, uh, we get actually slightly better accuracy and, and Cohen's kappa is improved as well. So in the second cluster, the performance is a bit better than in the overall group. And then in the cluster number three, uh, we get a much better classification accuracy. So in the cluster three, based on the divided based on the brain patterns, we get a better prediction from PAS data modality into diagnosis groups compared to without clustering. If you look at the, all the data sets together, rest in state fMRI. Um, classification performance improves from 67% to 72% in cluster 1. Cohen's kappa improves about 10%. Cluster number 2, accuracy is pretty poor. Kappa is, is smaller than 0, so the performance is, the mean performance here is, is about good as guessing. And without clustering, it was 67% and 29% of Cohen's kappa. And in cluster 3, uh, we get accuracy of 69% compared to uh, without clustering performance of 67% accuracy, and kappa is also improved by uh, about 10%. Then, um, prediction width PAS and resting state fMRI in cluster one. It's about the same performance um, in the cluster one. Cluster two, the performance is a bit poor. Have to remember that we have quite a few subjects in cluster two. So when you divide this data set into training set and the test set, obviously you you know, you're pretty lucky if you get great performance. The points should be, you know, really separable there if you get good, to get a good performance. And then uh, in cluster three, when you use PAS and rest state fMRI, we get a classification accuracy of 89% with kappa 63% compared to the without clustering performance 85% and 59%. Okay, so as a summary, uh, the premore adjustment scale um, is a pretty good data modality to predict uh, diagnosis groups. Resting state fMRI, it obviously can be used uh, to classify into diagnosis groups, but it is the combination of, of several data modalities here, PAS and resting state, that gives us a, a much improved performance. And also, the subtyping of the brain, when you find people with, if you use resting state, you find people with distinct sort of connection patterns and group them together and do classification in these um, different, you know, clusters. You can improve the performance. Um, obviously, these results are quite preliminary because the data set is limited in size and we have uh, data from two different data sets, uh, two different centers, so the center effect is there. And even with clustering, um, it could be that when we do the clustering, we actually get the center effect out from there and not the real Brain pattern, uh, brain, brain patterns there. So I think that's it for me. So questions, please. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Have we got any questions for Henry?
No? No? Uh, yeah, thanks for the nice talk. Um, I wanted to ask you um, maybe a question on the strategic level. So often you have a data set, for instance, clinical measures, as you presented the past, and resting state measures. Mm -hmm. So the question is always, do you put all in one bucket and then you cluster based on like this multimodal data? Or is it you cluster just based on one type of data and then you sort of use the other data to validate your clusters, right? Because mm. often uh, what comes after clustering very often, okay, what do, does, do those groups mean? Yeah. You know, uh, what are they uh, related to? What yeah. do you think is a, is yeah, a better be, strategy? Well, I, I, like, I like clustering each of the data model modalities separately because then it's clear to it's it's more straightforward to stop type uh, find the phenotype of the subjects with that pattern it becomes vastly more complicated when you increase the dimension and here when we're working with the neuroscience data the dimensions may be huge and trying to find those important aspects the important phenotypes there it can be daunting task so I, I like divide and conquer, so do it each data, you know, modality separately. But it could be that better performance may be achieved by by just combining all the data into clusters there. Okay, so we'll move on. Um, and uh, I'm afraid that uh, Professor Meissensal, who's down in the program, was not able to come today, but uh, Professor Paola Brambia, another co-investigator and my co-chair in this session, has uh, bravely agreed to step into the breach and uh, provide uh, a, an equally thrilling well, talk. Yeah, I try. I'm the brave. It's difficult to equal uh, Eva. So, But in this case, I'm presenting some data on the work package four of the Pronia, <clears throat> which is actually dedicated to the cognitive battery. Uh, in, uh, actually, these are the centers collaborating to the recruitment in Italy. We have uh, four main centers, one in Udine, one in Mila two in Milan, actually, one in uh, uh, Villa San Benedetto, and the other one uh, is a new, new entry in Casale Monferrato. So as per the cognitive pro profile, there are, uh, uh, in the literature, different studies showing that the uh, patient subjects at clinical risk to develop psychosis has deficit uh, in different uh, uh, domains <clears throat> like uh, in general intelligence, executive function, verbal fluency, social cognition, processing speed. This has been summarized in this meta-analysis and uh, the cognitive uh, deficits also relate to uh, outcome in these uh, uh, subjects and uh, treatment response and autonomy, so uh, cognition is very important also in a translational uh, uh, significance. In this case, uh, um, there are also other studies showing that, uh, for instance, a verbal memory or processing speed can be a reliable predictor for conversion, or uh, those with defective verbal and visual memory can have a faster transition to psychosis. In the Naples study, they have shown that uh, greater deficit in fluency is uh, more uh, uh, stable in those at genetic risk to psychosis, whereas greater deficit in verbal memory uh, is a, a feature for those at clinical risk uh, to develop psychosis. In general, uh, the um, subjects, uh, the converters, has, uh, mo have more neurocognitive performance uh, com compared to non-converters. Um, social cognition is also very important and has been shown to be impaired in this uh, population. And IQ, uh, last but not least, the, the uh, IQ has been shown to be impaired, even uh, in, in, particularly in patients with schizophrenia, uh, having a decreasing uh, overage uh, uh, IQ levels or even a, a lower I, a promorbid IQ. Uh, as it can, this figure represent uh, consistently, and particularly uh, they have shown for the performance IQ impairment in the digit symbol coding subtest. So neurocognition is very important, uh, as I briefly mentioned, for clinical, uh, for our clinical work, and to uh, possibly predict uh, the outcome of the patient. And this is actually one of the main aim of the project. 
uh, <clears throat> in terms of cognitive measurement for this project, we have used several uh, tests and subtests, and the uh, the idea was to use them uh, uh, on a, on a, on the iPad. So there's no pencil, uh, uh, paper and pencil tests, and they are all used in a. Uh, in a computerized form, uh, which has been implemented by our uh, collaborator uh, Giuseppe Cabras in our lab using this uh, Pebble software interface. The idea, as I said, is to, of course, use cognitive uh, markers to uh, feature this population and also to predict conversion to psychosis and using machine learning to predict the outcome in our uh, population. So, so this is not an updated uh, table uh, because now uh, the project has recruited many more subjects, but so far for this uh, presentation we included 180 controls and seven, eight uh, uh, first episode depressive, depressive patients, 66 uh, recent and psychosis and 77 clinical eye risk. We implemented the analysis uh, uh, using a um, one-way ANOVA and uh, using age, uh, verbal and performance IQ as covariates, and then uh, using Turkey postdoc comparisons. Uh, and the analysis has been performed uh, by Marco Garzito from our group. Uh, so I'm going to show you the, uh, the data that we have collected so far uh, related to each test. Uh, so, in this case, for the Rye Ostery complex figure, which gives you a measure, an idea of the visual spatial skills and visual long term memory of the subject, uh, it's subdivided in three steps. The subject first has to copy, and then there is an immediate recall, and after 30 minutes, they have to draw again, uh, so there is a delayed recall. And as you can see here, here you can see the groups, and they will be pretty much the same for all the figures later. So, healthy controls depressed, clinical high risk, and uh, recent psychosis. As you can see here, the uh, only f significant effects related to healthy controls is for the recent onset psychosis. I, I, uh, actually, uh, the recent onset psychosis had impairments for all the tests that I'm going to present, so pretty much uh, all of them, uh, whereas the clinical high risk has, uh, as a group, uh, uh, more specific uh, uh, deficits. For time of execution, uh, uh, the clinical high risk, interestingly, there is lower, and this is actually mirroring a, a later test I'm going to show you, which is the trail making test. The DANVA was uh, implemented and used for uh, recognition of facial, uh, facial emotion, so no verbal communication, very important for our patient. In this case, also the clinical risk uh, uh, perform, uh, performed uh, lower, significantly lower than controls, as well as the psychosis, psych psychotic patients. The digit span gives you an idea of the working memory. So it is uh, composed by two subtests. Uh, the list has to be repeated, and then uh, in the, the second step has to be repeated by in a reversed uh, uh, way. In this case, uh, only the ROP compared to the controls uh, uh, were impaired for the uh, backward test, uh, whereas the depressed patients were impaired in the forward uh, subtest. But the clinical high risk didn't have any uh, abnormalities in this case. They are always controlled by age, verbal IQ, performance IQ, as you can see here. <clears throat> if, you, if you take a total measure of the, of the test, we have uh, uh, um, abnormal impairment only in the ROP. For the verbal fluency, there, there are two subtests. One is the phonemic, and the other one is a semantic subtest. In the first one, the, uh, the subjects has to have to um, say or as many words as they can, starting with uh, uh, a particular letter. In this case, F, for instance. And the, in the semantic uh, semantic subtest, they have to uh, say as many words as they can within a particular category, in this case, for instance, animals. 
In this case, for the phonemic, only the ROP, ROP had uh, abnormal uh, performance. In the case of semantic, uh, uh, so uh, as per the category, also the clinical high-risk subjects had uh, uh, significant impairment. Okay, as per the errors, there is just a trend, but uh, so words not starting with F, for instance, there is no significant uh, uh, differences. For the RAY verbal learning test, it's kind of a complicated test, so there is an immediate recall phase where uh, the subject listen to a list of words, list A, and they get to repeat as many words as they can. Uh, there is an interference. After uh, five repetitions of the list A, there is a new list, list B, they get to listen to it, and they have to repeat as many words as they remember from list B. And then there is an immediate recall after this interference uh, related to the list A. After 30 minutes, they repeat uh, as many words as they can uh, based on the list A. And afterwards, at the end of the test, they have to recognize uh, as many words as they can within the list A. In this case, uh, here are represented the first phase of the list, the list A. As you can see here, the trend is pretty much similar for healthy controls, ROT, depressed patients, clinical high risk, and ROP, recent onset psychosis. There is an in in interference phase, post B, and a delayed phase. As you can see here, the clinical high risk uh, uh, have impairment for the immediate recall and the ROP also for the delayed list A. The CPT is a, is a classic test to investigate uh, uh, sustained attention. In this case, we use the uh, identical PERS version where you got to recognize uh, uh, the same number, similar numbers, one after the other one, like uh, 6319, for instance. There are some distractors. Could be like uh, a distractor with the same uh, uh, numbers but in different orders or there are random uh, uh, distractors. So as you can see here, the clinical high risk uh, performed uh, the, uh, the test correctly. It is interesting because the, they didn't have any uh, impairment even in the digit span for the working memory. So what we can consider working memory and uh, sustained attention uh, preserved in this population, at least uh, uh, based on our analysis so far. Uh, whereas we have seen that they are slower in the rye ostrich, for instance, and they are slower even in the uh, trail making test, as I'm going to show you later. Uh, okay, then we have the, the uh, it's a, it's a, it's a spend test, it's a self-order pointing test where they have to uh, select uh, in different trials uh, different uh, uh, signals signal or symbols and uh, so it, got, it, it gives you an idea of the perseveration errors uh, and um, in this case uh, only the uh, patient with recent onset psychosis had an impairment whereas the clinical high risk uh, uh, did not. Still, for perseveration and errors, as you can see here, uh, there is a, an abnormal performance for patients with recent onset psychosis. The trail making test, very popular. Uh, so, in the trail making A, they have to connect number dots. In the trail making B, they have to connect dots alternating numbers and letters. So, as a measure, you can measure time of executions <clears throat> or you can measure the ability of the visual motor skills. In this case, you can see here time of execution and time of switch. There is, uh, uh, as you can see, from uh, healthy controls to recent on psychosis, a uh, trend of increasing uh, time of execution, which is actually significantly slower in clinical high risk as well as for the recent onset psychosis. Switching from time B, time Time A, uh, it's only significant and abnormal for recent onset psychosis. The digit symbol substitution test, you have uh, uh, symbols 
which are paired to numbers, and then uh, for uh, this task, uh, uh, you got to uh, peer basically numbers to symbols. So you measure uh, sort of a speed and attention related to cognitive processing. Still, as per the uh, trail making test, there is a, a, a lower level, significantly lower level in the clinical high risk for the correct matchings. So we, we still are, we, I mean, I'm roughly speaking, we are in the framework of uh, uh, visual motor precision or uh, slowness in the terms of motor, motor abilities. This is kind of uh, uh, complicated test. It's a salience attribution test. The subjects have to uh, click on the black square based on the, I mean, uh, uh, based on symbols. And they got to learn uh, as they make the test that uh, some symbols are related more to winning uh, some uh, uh, awards or money. Uh, so it's kind of a learning, uh, learning procedures, uh, and so uh, at the end we can infer the ability to give salience to relevant stimuli and categories, uh, and, and then at the end there is also subjective perception on how the test uh, went. So there is also a subjective estimate of silence, so we can compare those two parameters. In this case, uh, there is an impairment only in uh, uh, recent onset psychosis patients, but interestingly, there's no correlation with age and IQ, no impact for age and IQ. Okay, still here, as you can see, still the ROP for the uh, category salience estimate they are impaired significantly compared to healthy controls. IQ, there is only differences for, significant differences for recent onset psychosis compared to the three other groups, compared to ethnic controls, compared to recent onset depression, and compared to clinical high risk. So let me conclude this uh, brief presentation saying that uh, what we have found here in clinical high risk uh, so far in our population is a uh, uh, two major, in my opinion, uh, domains uh, like uh, visual motor precision, which is impaired, and uh, um, social emotion recognition. Those two categories are impaired in different uh, tasks. They can actually be overlapping a little, a little bit. Of course, now we have to implement this to first provide the normative, normative data for our battery. That will be the next step. Second will be to uh, have a figure of a general figure, of, as, I, as I presented here, for the updated uh, recruited uh, patients. And then we would like to implement uh, uh, machine learning procedures to use this kind of uh, uh, markers as predictors for conversion, predictor outcome, and uh, uh, treatment response. Not surprisingly, the uh, recent onset psychosis patients were compromised in all domains, and the recent onset depression only in a measure of uh, uh, sort of working memory test. So let me thank, finally, uh, the group working uh, in Italy. So our group in Udine that started the project originally when I was there. Particularly, I'd like to thank uh, for helping me in uh, um, pre the, the presentation, actually putting together the presentation, Carolina Bonivento, and for the analysis, uh, uh, Marco Garzito, and all the group for uh, recruiting the patients in Udine. The group in Milan, where we have uh, actually the second uh, uh, center of recruitment, the Programma 2000, and uh, uh, the Milano Niguarda Hospital, particularly Anna Meneghelli, Maurizio Sberna, and Emiliano Monzani. We have a third center of recruitment uh, at the Policlinico now, and I recently moved there. And uh, our friends uh, at the Villa San Benedetto, Professor Perna and Dr. Maria Nobile. So this is actually the 
re most recent uh, leaflet for the recruitment at the Policlinico Hospital in our department, directed by Professor Altamura. <clears throat> and that's the, uh, actually the lift that, that I circulated also on the tables. Uh, so for the Italian people that want to take uh, a look at it, that you can find some lift that's around. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. Are there questions for Paolo? No, I, wonder, I have not seen this before, Paolo, so I get to ask a, a quick question. I wonder whether um, you might just indicate how you feel the cross-language uh, basis of, the, of our study can be dealt with in the same way that Josef has been looking at these side effects. To what extent do you think that's going to be a really relevant issue? Yeah, right. Thanks for raising this uh, very important issue. We haven't looked at it so far, uh, but uh, with the uh, updated numbers of recruited subjects, we can actually stratify by centers and see if there is any uh, center effect. Actually, we have, uh, I believe, uh, uh, four languages in the Pronia because we have Finnish, Italian, German, and English. Uh, some of the tests actually have been uh, the, 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 the Potential central effects has been uh, abated by the iPad, iPad uh, solution. Uh, but still, yes, we need to make uh, uh, a big efforts in trying to, um, norm I mean, analyze the data per center. Then we have this webinar as well, where we we take a webinar. I think monthly or every two months. Don't remember exactly. Uh, so for I mean, it's centralized for the Pronia, so we can exchange uh, doubts or uh, make any uh, improvement in terms of administration of the test. So this is very important also to take it through, uh, through the project up to the, 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 the end of the, the Pronia, which will never end because we will have Pronia 2 and 3. I'm sure that Nikos will make the best to exactly be funded again. <laughs> okay. Um, well, in that case, thank you very much for your attention and uh, my apologies for the non-appearance of Professor Roman, but I promise you that the next time you see him, he will give a, tw a talk twice as long to make up for it. Thank you.